All right, everybody, uh, welcome to our workshop today. This is making the move to the Blackboard Ultra Course View. We're going to be looking at the new Ultra Course View that is available now, and it's been around for a few years, but we have a timeline at NIU. We're trying to get everyone to migrate to the Ultra Course View, preferably by the uh, one year from now, so like January 2024, so spring of 2024, we're hoping to get as many people um, transferred over and working in the Ultra Course View at that point. But um, you're here today, so we're going to work with you. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Michael Taylor. I'm an instructional support specialist for the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. That's my contact information. Um, feel free to contact me anytime if you have questions on Blackboard, Blackboard Ultra, any you know general tech questions about teaching online or teaching with Blackboard. Uh, I'm here to help uh, as part of the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning. And you can also just contact our center directly. We have a number of staff that have um, different backgrounds in educational technology, instructional design, uh, pedagogy, faculty development, et cetera, et cetera. So we're here to help with pretty much any aspect of your teaching with Blackboard, teaching online, best practices for teaching, and even teaching in the classroom, teaching with technology in the classroom, all, all kinds of stuff. So feel free to check out our website. I'm going to share that with you here. This is this is not our direct website. This is one of our websites that is important today. This is our uh, Black Teaching with Blackboard website. And that particular link takes you to our ultra section, which you'll, want to, you'll probably want to bookmark this website because it's going to be helpful for you in the future. I'm going to put um, our general website here in the chat. So if anyone didn't doesn't know. It's just niu.edu slash CITL. So I put that in the chat if you want to get it. Okay, great. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the Blackboard Ultra Course View. This is kind of a rough agenda of how I do this. Um, since we have such a big class today and, and the, the timing of this is like our classes are starting next week. So I want to I'm going to put a poll up here. So just give me one second to type this out. I want, I want to know who's planning to use the Ultra Course View this semester. So I'm going to pop this poll up. And if everybody can answer this, that would be great. I want to get a rough idea of people that are planning to use it this semester because We've got a pretty tight timeline, and um, I just want to make sure that everybody understands uh, what they need to do to get that done before classes start next week. Some people might have classes that start later, I know, but in general, most classes are starting next week. Okay, great. Looks like we've got about half, half and a half, eight to seven. A couple of people haven't responded, so that, that's fine. Um, like I said, we've got a big class today, so if you have further questions, it's probably going to be best to set up an appointment with someone at CIDL, but I'll try to cover as much stuff as I can today. But since we have such a big class, I want to cover some of the meat and potato stuff, the, the basics of how, how it's best to move forward. If you're building a new course or converting an existing course that might be in the original course view. Okay. All right. So let me shut this pull down. All right. Great. So yeah, just take a look at the agenda here. This is kind of what we're going to cover. So I already mentioned the NAU timeline. We're trying to get everyone to the Ultra Course View by the end of this calendar year, or you know, it, in technical terms, the beginning of January 2024 for the spring semester of 2024. I'm sure there's going to be some special cases where that's not the case, and we're working at those people and departments separately to figure out the best way to move forward. But if you're an individual instructor and you're teaching your own classes and you're sort of responsible for building your own courses. That's what this is for so that you can have that skill set and just move forward and then use us as a resource to figure out any problems you're having and, and, and solutions in that case. So, um, so first thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to sharing my screen so I can show you some of these, uh, some of these resources that we have available. So just give me one moment. I'm going to switch over. Okay. 
Okay, so you should be seeing my screen now, and I'm going to switch over. So this is our, our main um, main page for the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. I'd recommend bookmarking this page. We have a lot of resources here that can help with not just Blackboard, but other types of things around teaching and learning. Um, but what is most important today is if you look under this Programs tab, we have self-paced programs. And one I want to point out is transitioning to the Ultra Course View. So I think this will be a good follow-up to this meeting today. You can take this. This is designed to be a three-week um, synchronous kind of course that we do with faculty. We've done this, uh, I think, two, yeah, two times in the summer and the fall, and we're planning to do uh, do a work, do one of these in the spring. But this is the self-paced version, so you get the same content, and it kind of covers a lot of the basics of building your course and understanding some things. So it goes a little beyond what I'll be able to cover today. So this would, I'd recommend signing up for this um, self-paced course and just taking a look at it, especially if you're building a more complex course, because it gets into some of the course design stuff and some of the other uh, nuts and bolts and things of what you need to know. OK. <clears throat> All right, so here's the thing. So what I this is so this is what I recommend everyone start with if you're doing uh, doing something uh, with with the Ultra Course View. Um, if you're familiar with requesting courses, I'm, and so just please follow along. I want to double check. Yeah, you can see my screen. So if you log into Blackboard, you're going to land on this on, on our institution page, and if you scroll down uh, to this link tools you're going to find the Blackboard faculty tools right here. So if you've requested courses in the past, you're going to be familiar with clicking on my courses and requesting courses. So in this case, though, I'm recommending that you request a shell. So you can click on my shells. And there's an option here to request a new shell. So feel free to do this right now if you're if you're logged into Blackboard or can do that quickly. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do, and I just want to make sure that everybody has at least one shell set up so that in some cases this this can this little step will save you some headache with conversion, copying, and building. Because what I don't want to see happen is people bu start building their course live in a in their live course and then have problems and need to like convert back to original. Although that's possible, it's it requires you know, our do it department to get involved and, and all kinds of stuff. So especially given the time frame where if you're building this out for this semester, this is going to help you make sure that you're ready to go. And, and then once you understand the process, this will actually save you time in the long run and, and help you with, you know, figuring out how things work. So if you request a new shell, you just click on here. You have to give it a department and a number, but you can change that name. One thing to keep in mind with the shell is the shell is just for you and anyone you invite into it. Students don't have access to the shell unless you invite them in, other uh, faculty. So this is just a workspace for you, like a sandbox for you to start developing your course. And um, I, I believe it makes the process um, much easier. I'm just going to do, um, I'm going to do one just so that we have an example to look at. So I've calling it ACCY 101. You know what, I'm going to use 107 today because I might have used 101 in the past. I use these numbers just to diff because these are test courses and I want to make sure they're not associated with any particular course so I, I can look them up easily. But you can use whatever number you want. And like I said, you can change that once the, once the shell exists. So your Blackboard shell request will go through. Usually it only takes a few moments for that shell to be generated. If everybody's doing it right now, it might take a little bit longer, but generally it comes up pretty quickly. And then you'll want to come back here and go to the courses list. And um, I usually use this search box. Your shells are going to be under current courses as opposed to a semester. And that has to do with the fact that it's the shells are set up with continuous um, availability, so they're always available. So they don't actually fall into a particular uh, semester. So that's why they come up under current courses. You can also limit this to like courses I teach. I have a lot of courses 
probably more than most because these are all test courses and courses I, I've helped work on with different faculty and stuff. But sometimes it takes a little bit of time for um, those shells to show up, but they generally show up under what's called assorted dates. And there it is, uh, shell ACCY7. So when you get your shell, you'll notice that it has this gray bar on the side. And it also says original course view. And currently, anytime you request a new course or shell, it's going to come up with the original course view because that's the this default right now. After you convert it, you'll see one of these colored bars here. And that indicates that, and that it's an ultra. Also, you'll notice that it doesn't say ultra course view any longer. So that's how that works. Um, so if I go into my shell here, I'm going to see this pop-up window. Now, you 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 should see this on your shells. You may not see this on your courses, uh, but I'm going to show you how to get it. So let's say you came into the course and that wasn't there. The thing you're going to be looking for is this pencil tool up here. It's the green and orange pencil tool at the top. If you don't see this in a course, it's probably because your course is available and you need to make the course unavailable. If you notice when the lock is open, the course is available and you can't do a conversion. So if you requested a new course, they usually come available by default. So you'll need to click on this lock icon and get the pencil tool. And then when you click on the pencil tool, that pop up is going to come back. OK, so I want to just stop at this point. Does anyone have any questions so far on this process? So you can do this with both courses and shells. I'm, I'm recommending that you do it with a shell to get started. Um, and and that's way you have a place to start working and building your uh, ultra course. And then once I show you the copy process from ultra to ultra, it's very easy and and it, it won't it's very smooth to like copy this shell into your actual live course. But I don't see any questions at this point, so I'm going to I'm just going to keep going. OK, so I'm going to convert this to the ultra course view. This step again with with an empty course like this or an empty shell like this it doesn't take very long it probably takes less than a minute to convert of course when i say that today it's going to take longer because we're doing it live but um i have i have other shells if if this one doesn't convert but you'll notice it's saying it's converting here and oftentimes it converts a little bit faster than um it takes a while for the refresh to come through and, and tell you that it's done, but it's probably already done. In most cases, it, like I said, it only takes a few seconds since there's no real content in the course to convert. But one way you can kind of like uh, speed it up, it doesn't really speed it up, but it speeds up the refresh is you can force a refresh by going to like the institution page, coming back to courses and then scrolling back down. And let's see if, under, again, it's under assorted dates We'll see if no, it's still um, still converting according to this. So, like I said, of course I do it live, and it's it's going to take extra time. Another thing you might want to notice: this is just a general thing. Oh, there it says your course has been converted, so it is ready to go now. Um, if you notice, there's these little star icons over on the side. These will move your courses and shells into your favorites list, which is at the top of this at the top. And uh, that might be helpful too, like during a semester or during this building process, you may want to use that favorite icon or sorry, favorite um, star to move it up into your favorites list and it makes it easier to find. In my case, I actually have too many courses in my favorites list, so it's probably easier for me to find it um, here. But yeah, you just click on that star and it'll pull it up into this. If you notice, it says favorites here, favorites. So that'll be at the top of your list. OK, so once you've once you've done the uh, the conversion process, there's a couple more steps to make sure this is completed. So when you come in here, you'll notice here at the bottom, it says explore the ultra course view. So what's happened is the origin it's in what's called the ultra course preview. And this allows you to like kind of play around with it. And theoretically, you can copy it back to an original course. I don't recommend doing that, like especially with shells. If you want an original shell, just Re request a new shell. Um, I see that somebody has a question, so let me check in here. Bill, I, did you raise your hand? Do you, have, you can turn on your mic or type a question if you have a question. Um, Jim, make sure you go to your course from the course list and not from the my courses and my shells list. And that is probably why you're not seeing the pencil tool. 
So if you can, Jim, if you can give me a thumbs up that you heard that or uh, let me know that you heard my message. Um, that's probably what's going on there. And Bill, I still see your, your hand up. Do you have a question? And Jim, I see you put your hand up. I'm hoping that means it worked. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. Okay, so, so I was saying is, so the first thing that happens is it comes into the ultra preview mode. So you'll want to click on this black button at the bottom right that says use the ultra course view. It's going to ask you if you're sure. And you say yes, use the ultra course view. Now, now you're in the ultra course view. And the last step that I recommend, because I've seen this catch some people, is go ahead and close the course and then come back into it one more time. That way it has a chance to completely refresh. It Now it should be ready to build and do course copies and all that kind of stuff. OK. All right, so I want to take just a quick second. Does everybody understand this process, or at least um, it make it makes sense. Any if anyone has any questions at this point, let me know so I can so I can cover that. Okay. All right. So the next the next thing that you can do is so let me see how do I want to do this? Which order? So we have a few options on building courses, and I guess it depends on where you're at. So let me start with. Scenario one is you have a brand new course, you've never taught it before, or you have a really old course and you're just planning to start from scratch. So if you want to start from scratch and build a new course in the ultra course view, um, you just can there's two ways you can do that. One is you just start with this blank um, course and start building content. Now this, this I, we don't have enough time to cover like all of the steps of how to add content and add different things. But in general, when you want to add something, you click on this plus sign and you get some options. So, so if you want to just build from scratch, you probably would click on create and you'll see that you can add a learning module, which is kind of like a folder that contains things. And then there is the actual folder, which is more like what you'd be used to, like on like a Windows or Mac computer. You have a folder, you can put things in the folder. Um, learning module is a little different, but it it's because it's a, the visually different on the screen and it kind of contains the information a little differently. Um, I'd recommend using learning modules if you're building out like a weekly or modular course. So you can have like week one, week two, week three, like that. Um, let me show you an example. So if you click on that, you basically would just give this a name. So I'm going to call this mod, module one. And everything defaults hidden to students. So this allows you to build the course, even if it's live with students. Um, and then when you're ready to show it, you can switch to visible and then it makes it visible. You can add a description. This shows up in b beneath. So this might be, you know, um, or, you know, I'm just doing something that's kind of redundant, but module one, and this might cover like week one and week, week two. Um, a lot of people also will in the title here, they might put date ranges. So this might be like January um, 15th through what's the next week after that would be January. Um, sorry, I'm doing math in my head real quick. Let's say it's 22. I think that's close enough. So anyway, you can do this. So this is just some best practices on how to design your course. And we can, we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end. But I just want to show you an example here. When you click Save, it'll create this module. And then you can open the module and add content inside the module. So example might be you want to add a document. A document is a special um, thing in, in Ultra. So don't think of it as a Word document. It's more like a miniature web page that you can design with text and images and e even HTML content. And you can create some, some like uh, learning objects like that inside your course. Um, so this is the basics of building. So the other option is, and this is also help. We've we've developed a template. So let me show you. So let's say you decided, oh, I'm gonna I want to get started um, with a template. So another thing to keep an eye out is all of these three dots expand a menu for all for the features and actions you can take on a particular item. 
So in this case, I'm going to delete the module, and that'll also delete the thing that's inside the module. So if you're building a new course, we we have we can do this for you. So you'll have to <coughs> make a request to uh, to the CIDL team. But if you go, um, and this is going to display two things. So copy content is where you can pull content from past courses, either ultra or original, into your ultra shell. So I'm going to do this copy content. And we have this thing called the CIDL master course shell. So I'm going to click on this. And what this allows you to do, this copy content, is you can copy an entire course. Or if you click into it, you can copy folders. So maybe just the content folder. And if I keep going down, you're going to see more and more specific information from the course. So this is like all of the documents from that course. Um, and then here's a folder. So you can even go down into a folder and just get one particular document or a file from the course. But in this case, I want to copy the entire uh, the entire template. So this is something you can request from us and we can put it in your shell or in your course so you can get started. So I'm going to copy this template over. And this, this should only take about a minute or so to copy over. But this is another great place to get started with um, if you're building a new course. The next thing we'll talk about is if you have an existing course that you want to kind of copy or copy and convert and we're going to talk about the copy and conversion process but anyway this this should only take a moment um, again um, oftentimes the copy process is faster than the refresh so if you go to like the grade book let's say it will uh, be there when i come back to content see here it is so it still might be copying some of the folders but i think pretty much everything's here yep it's already complete okay so this is our template, and this gives you a great starting place to, to customize. So we have like a welcome page document, um, and your instructor document. We have a folder for syllabus and course information. So there's some boilerplate stuff in here that you can use to get started. Uh, let me show you an example. So if we go to the welcome page. It doesn't have any real content, but it kind of gives you a structure. So you can put your course description, your course objectives, um, you're getting started information to your students, maybe explaining how you're organizing the course in modules or weeks. And here's some ideas. Yeah. So but there's some nice stuff like the accessibility statement, contact information for the DRC is here. So these are things that you probably want to have in your course for your students. So this template is a good gives you a good starting point. Even if even if you have some of these stuff in it, like I said, if you have a course that's been around for a few years and you need to this is a good refresher, so you might want to use this to refresh your course and get give it a fresh start. And like I said, with that copy content thing, you can pull in specific content from your past courses into the places you want it. So, for example, if you have a syllabus or a, a course introduction or a course schedule that you've already created, like you could click on this plus sign, do copy content, find your course here. So let's say it's from like. Uh, fall 22. I don't know if I have a fall 22. Like I'm not an instructor. So but yeah, so here, here's an example of a fall 2022 course. Um, you would find you could just drill into your content, find your um, syllabus or copyright information, whatever, and just pull that one document over. And uh, so so this 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 uh, copy tool is pretty nice. So you can copy large bits of content or individual things. So like I said, and if you're doing this in a shell, the nice thing is this shell is, is yours to work on and, and modify and update. Um, what some people do is they actually have a couple shells and one shell is the one they're kind of like building their own template for all of their courses that they're teaching. And then, then they use the other shell to kind of like, kind of like create a specific course. And then, then again, with that copy tool, is when you actually request your course for spring 2023 or summer 2023, whenever you're ready to do this, you'll be able to copy the shell with just that one click, kind of pull it all into your upcoming course. And then all you need to do is update things like due dates and, and things that are specific to your semester. OK, so let me pause there. Any questions so far on this workflow? Any questions about? How you might want to approach this, different, you know. Hi, 
Hi, Jim. Yeah, go ahead. If you have your mic, it's probably best. Uh, I, okay. Um, I got things up and running, but how, and while I was doing that, I missed how you got to that template. Oh, okay. The template is something that you'll need to request from CIDL right now. We don't have, okay. it's, it's done through a course copy that, um, only so many people have access to that right now. So it's probably better if you want the template, just to send an email. You can send the email to me directly. And okay. my email is mktaylor at niu.edu. Right. I'll put I got you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. And, and then I can, if you tell me the shell name, uh, I can look it up and pull that template in for you. Okay. Um, after this, we're done with the workshop today. All right. And thanks. Jennifer, I saw you had a question. Let me catch up here. How do I copy over the BB shell again? Um, so Jennifer, do you mean? Um, yeah, it's a, hey Mike. Yeah, it's the same question. Okay. Um, so yeah, go yeah. ahead and send me an email with your shell okay. uh, name, and I'll, and I'll work with you to get the template in there if you want it to start I, with the template. Yeah, I might already have it. I'll I'll yeah I'll okay. check on that. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. So. So the other thing is if you do have a course that you've built in the past and you're happy with it and, you, and you're happy with the structure, um, I, you don't need to use the template. Um, you can actually just copy your course over like I did um, like I did with the template. Now now here's the thing to keep in mind. when you copy an original course into your ultra course, it does what's called a conversion. It's it's technically converting it from the original course to the ultra course. Sometimes when you do a conversion, certain content will not copy at all, or it will copy imperfectly. So that's another reason I recommend doing it first in a shell to see how messed up it's going to be or what's going to be missing. Now, the good news is most stuff copies over just fine. Sometimes there's some formatting issues if you're using like tables or really, you know, sophisticated or, or complex layouts and stuff. Um, the one thing though, that doesn't work super well is if you have lots of nested folders. So if you're, if you're someone that builds a course out with lots of like layers where you have like your top level folder and then a folder inside a folder and then another folder in there, and then maybe documents. So. Um, Ultra at the moment is limited to two layers of nesting, two levels of nesting, let's say. And I can show you an example of this. So, um, so for example, we have our top layer he level here, and then you have a folder. So if I go into this folder, you'll see that there's a bunch of documents in here. Now I can add, I'm going to add, when you go to create, I can still add another folder here. So this would be my second level of nesting. But if I go into this folder and try to add another folder, I can't. You see that it's missing here? So this is the extent of the depth of, of, of a course at the moment. They are talking about increasing the number of folders that you can have, but at the moment it's just two. So one thing that can happen when you do a course copy is that it'll just, it, what it does is it kind of kicks things out of folders so that it stays within this, uh, two folder structure. So you'll need to kind of reorganize your course, um, reorganize your course uh, after the copy and conversion. Um, so that again, another reason to do it in a shell because you can see and see what it's gonna look like. And then you have a chance to like clean it up, clean it up and fix it before you go into your live course. Um, like I said, so for courses that aren't super robust you don't have a lot of content a lot of courses you know are really just um, fairly straightforward because if you're teaching in person often it's just a place to hold your shell maybe you have some online quizzes some documents things like that so those courses tend to copy over and convert just fine and um, like i said you'll want to try it and see how it goes um, something you can check after you do the the copy is there's this conversion exceptions right here. And if you click on review all exceptions, now in this case, the, we copied something that didn't have any problems. So it comes up zero, 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 but you, you may see some things over here. Um, so sometimes they're just warnings. They might tell you something like, um, I think, you know, one problem, problem that came up and they may even change this, but if you have rubrics, sometimes the rubrics structure is different in ultra than it is in original. So you may need to 
update your rubrics or recreate your rubrics in Ultra. Um, other things, like I said, are the folder structure um, and some formatting if you're using like tables or, or more like HTML type structures on some of your pages, they may not convert perfectly over and you might need to update those and improve them for, so they look better in the ultra course view. But yeah, like I said, in general, most of this works pretty well. And it's just a matter of taking some time to review your content after you convert it to make sure it's working. Um, so let me take a break here. Is it, does anyone have any specific questions or concerns that I could, could address before we move on? Or if there's any big, bigger topics that you want me to cover? I know I, I didn't show too much about the building process. Um, you, usually we don't have enough time to get too deep into the, to the building process. Um, like I said, that Ultra Transition Academy, this will give you some more insights on that. Um, there's also the grade book, which is important for you to set up correctly. Um, but yeah, feel free to um, let me know if there's anything over here that you're that you're thinking about. Okay. Um, let me pull up the uh, grade book real quick. This is something if you're if when you're building your course out, uh, you're going to need to make sure your grade book is set up correctly. Oh, looks like somebody had a question. Uh, no, I guess that was a false alarm. Oh, is there a separate tutorial for setting up the grade book? Yeah, um, so we do workshops on the grade book all the time. Uh, there's information in that Ultra Transition Academy about the grade book. And um, I'm pretty sure there's some other resources on our website on the grade book. I do the, I teach the grade book workshop pretty often a couple times a year. So um, I'm gonna give like a basic overview of the grade book here right now. So hopefully that will, hopefully that'll help. Um, so the number one thing you're gonna need to check on the grade book this is just my workflow, and I feel like this workflow is it covers your bases real quick. So the first thing you need to do, know is you're just going to have to, if you're new to Ultra, you're just going to have to learn the interface. That's part of it. So the gradebook has a link here. At, this is your top navigation that gets you to most of your, your sections of your course. So the gradebook is here. The gradebook can be displayed in, you know, really there's like three different ways to display the gradebook so you have this list view and this is gradable items you can switch over to the student view when you have students this will show the students names and what their grades are you can also go to the spreadsheet view which is what you're probably familiar with with the original course view so it has all of your assignments listed here and all the or sorry all your assignments and columns and all your students in the in the rows here so this is a blank course so there aren't any but um we do have a couple sample assignments. And then the other thing that's really important is this gear icon. So when you see gear icons, this is the settings um, window. And this will open up your um, grade, grade book settings. So the, the first thing you're going to want to check is the schema. Because so, this is the only way for your grades to actually calculate correctly. So the default schema looks, looks like this. And it has all these different uh, breakpoints, A minus, B plus. So if you're not using those and you are just doing, let's say, A, B, C, D, F, so the first thing you'd want to do is come in and delete those extra um, rows from the gradebook. So you have your standard gradebook like uh, this. But if you need to add a row, you just hover in between. And then let's, if you want to add an A minus, now you ha have an A minus. Then the next step would be you just want to type in the lowest uh, number for each grade. So an F would be zero. In this case, a D is 60. Our A is, or sorry, C is 73, 83. Let's say we're going to give, um, this will be a 90. Let's say this is a 92. So you can type in 92. And then this would be, let's say, 95. OK, so the thing you do. You'll notice that these, these, this uh, far right column hasn't updated yet. It will update when you save it. It'll ask you if you're ready to save. You say yes, and then it updates it. 
Now I get this question all the time. People are like, well, what is, why is it 95 here and 95 here? Just, just know that if somebody scores below a 95, they're going to get an A minus. And if they score a 95 or higher, they get the A. And the reason for that is, so there's no gap between like, what if somebody got a 94 point five, then it wouldn't make sense. Like where was that fall between the A minus or B? So it just think of it as a number line with a, with a, a marker on the number line that if you cross that threshold, you go up to the higher grade. So it works out, it, it works out mathematically and, and logistically this way. But yeah, just make sure your grade schema is set correctly for your, and it should match your syllabus, you know, so that students are getting the correct grades. Um, and then you can go through here and there's some, some pretty nice features in the, in the, um, in the uh, settings here. So one thing I got a message on this yesterday. So I, I think they've disabled this uh, uh, student performance activity alerts. There was some negative feedback from faculty and students that this wasn't helpful. And, and I think they've turned it off. So it's even though it's here in the settings, these activity alerts aren't going to get out to the students. So I wouldn't worry about this this semester. Um, we may turn it back on or look at an alternative use, but I guess it was causing some some stress when it was telling students, because it mostly only sends out bad bad news, which could be helpful for some students, but I guess I guess like the consensus was it wasn't working the way we'd like it to. So I think they've disabled this at the at the top level. So don't don't worry too much about this. But if you have questions about this, um, you can always contact the department and we can talk to you about it. So things that things that are really useful though, automatic zeros, it this will if you turn this on, this will give a zero to students that don't turn in their homework that have due dates. So if you have a due date for tomorrow and they don't turn it in, it gives them a zero. If you have a late turn in policy, you can always override the zero, but this does remind the student that, hey, you didn't turn it in on time and you have a zero. The nice thing about this too is when you do running total grades, if you don't have zeros in your grade book, students' grades may look higher than they should be because it doesn't calculate non-graded assignments. So until there's a number in that cell, the student, so for example, a student could get an A plus on the first assignment, then have five zeros. It still says they have an A plus until you put those zeros in, then obviously they're gonna have an F. So the automatic zeros just saves you some time, especially if you have a bigger class or you've got to do a lot of manual grading, you can turn this on. And, and the workaround is if you want an assignment that doesn't have an automatic zero, just don't put a due date in or put a due date in the far future, like at the end of the semester or something. And then the zero won't be triggered until the end of the semester. So that that's one way uh, you can do it because it's it's not set up uh, it's set up globally and it's not set up per assignment. But you can use the due date of the assignment itself to control whether the, when this turns on or not. Um, the other thing you might want to look at is grade categories. So especially if you're doing weighted grading, you're going to need to make sure you have the categories. And when you create ass assessments. You're going to want these assessments to line up to categories. You can add new categories by clicking on the add new category. So let's say, I don't know, what's a good example. Um, um, I always do this one because, sorry, I can't spell field trip because that's what I want to do when I'm in class. But anyway, um, just joking. But yeah, if you have a different uh, grading category and you want to put these in different categories, you can do that. Um, you can also create grading rubrics here. So if you use rubrics for your assignments, you can create them here. You can also create the rubric on the assignments themselves, or you can create them here. And then when you create the assignment, you can attach it to the assignment. So it's there, it's integrated that way. Any any questions on, on the gradebook settings? The final thing for the grade, well, not the final thing, but like the next big thing is the overall grade. You'll see this thing uh, set up overall grade. It's also in the gradebook settings. If you scroll down, you'll see set up overall grade. And this is where you have to set up either you're using points, weighted, or an advanced calculation that you've created yourself. Um, points is pretty straightforward. It just takes the total number of points and divides it by the total points. You have your earned points divided by total points, and then the schema gives them the letter grade that would be equivalent to that percentage. Weighted gets a little more um, nuanced because you can set up different categories with different 
weights. Um, we don't really have time to go into the details of how to how to set this up correctly, but I just want to point it out to you. Um, you can do this. And like I said, if you have questions, we have more resources on, you can contact me and we can go through your grade setup or we do, we especially toward the end of the semester do a final grade um, workshop. But I, I recommend getting this set up at the beginning of your semester. That way the grades that your students are seeing, um, especially their final grade is, is as accurate as it can be. So there's no surprises at the end of the semester. Okay, so let's see, any question? Yep, yep, you can do weights in the grade book. So one catch is if you're doing, if you have extra credit in your course, it's really tricky to do extra credit with weighted grades. I found a way to do it. I don't know if it's like, it's so kind of convoluted that I don't, haven't really shown anyone how to else. I've shown a couple of people how to do it. I don't know. So if you're really doing extra credit, um, and you're and and waiting get in touch with us so that we can help you figure out the best way to do that sometimes it's just easier to manually and give increase people's grades at the end of the semester add some extra points to their score somehow um but there's also some other workarounds like if 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 you're thinking about helping students um giving them kind of like some uh, what do you call it, like a boost under grade, you can do like these, see where it says edit calculation rules under assignment. So it's really easy there. Um, you can click on this and you can do things like drop scores. So let's say you have 10 assignments and you want to drop like the lowest one or two, two not the lowest Q, the lowest one. Um, so this would let you drop the lowest one score, one score drop. So it's giving me this warning because I think there's only one assignment, so one item. So it's like, hey, are you sure you want to drop the only assignment? If you have multiple assignments, it, it'll work though. So that's something there. Um, okay, so any other broad questions anyone has? Anything that you want me to demonstrate? I just, I can go back and repeat anything that maybe wasn't clear. If, if anyone's um, stuck on any of the steps that we covered today, um, I just want to reiterate, I think it's really the best move is to get a shell set up and start working in the shell. That way you can learn the interface um, and start experimenting with how you want to organize your course. Um, of course, you can write, get our template and that's a good starting point. And you can always delete or modify that template if it's not you know, exactly what you would like. But well, we, we've, we've had a lot of positive feedback on the template, especially some of those um, partially created like boilerplate files. And it, it's really good for the students too, because some of those files have resources already you know, in there. So you don't have to go look up what's the DRC phone number and email address and what is the, the um, advising. I think they might even have the advising. I haven't looked at it in a bit, but some of those boilerplate files are really, it, just those alone, can be helpful that, and you can modify them for your particular department or course. Um, and then, you know, the, let me see if we get it. But yeah, so, so here's the thing. So if you're, if you're here today, I just want to let you know, you're in, you're still in, the, you're like ahead of the curve. We're still working with faculty. I think the last numbers came in, we're at about, um, I think it was, 30% of courses are in ultra right now as of last semester and about 40% of faculty are using ultra. It, the numbers might be slightly higher than that because um, some people do combine sections and I don't know if it's counting the child courses because sometimes you don't, you don't have to convert your child courses. That, that's another thing I'll point out. If you're teaching um, a combined section where you have a master course and a child course, you don't necessarily have to convert the child course to um, to ultra, you can if you want, but but the way it works here at NIU is those courses become unavailable and they're just sharing the roster with the master course. So you're really not building in them and you don't have to convert them to ultra if you don't want to. Um, you can, I think it won't matter either way. So that might be skewing our numbers down a little bit, but yeah, we're, we're, we haven't quite hit 50% of courses yet. So you guys are still in the first first half of the 
thing. And if, if you're thinking about look, what I've recommended to faculty is if you're teaching multiple courses, maybe convert one course this semester just to get, get going. And I know now it's, there's only a few days. So I understand if, if you're not um, ready to convert. Uh, one thing you can do like with the shell is if you have a shell, you can start building your course while you're teaching it in the shell, kind of like each week you can kind of copy you know, what you're doing in your shell. And then by the end of the semester, you're gonna have your course built out, um, ready to go for the next time you teach it. Um, and if you're, you know, but if you're gonna do your first course in the summer or in the fall, you know, this is a good time to get started. And then you can always set up time with somebody at CIDL if you have questions about like some of the deeper things you're trying to sort out in the ultra course view. So yeah, it, it takes some time to get used to the new interface and there's some things in it that are I would say there's some things in it that are a little quirky sometimes, so you just need to figure out. Um, it's tr it, it tries to help you sometimes. It'll throw up a little, a throw an error up or stop you from doing something occasionally. And and if you're not used to it, you'll it takes a little bit to get used to. But that's why I, it's nice to have a shell so you can practice and try things um, without having to worry about it messing up an actual live course. And um, if you are going to just do go into your live course and go ultra, that's fine too. Make sure you just let us know if you get stuck on something or something isn't working as you would expect. That's what we're here for at CIDL is to help you with this transition and then in just in general, like t better teaching online, teaching practices with Blackboard and stuff. So stay in touch um, with us. I think I've covered pretty much everything unless people have specific questions or, or general questions that they'd like me to demonstrate. Um, I've, this, we had a really good turnout today. I'm glad, I'm glad to see this because a, a few of our previous workshops have been kind of small. And I think people are starting to realize that this is the, um, the time is coming to, to get, get started with this. And like I said, you guys are still in the first 50% or 40%, I would say. So um, don't worry, we're just all working together. We have a huge, you know, relatively large institution. And that's why we haven't like forced this change like in one semester. There's just no way we could have managed, managed that much like change in one semester. So we've been taking our time and, and working with people. And like I said, um, keep an eye on our, our website for other workshops. We have lot, pretty much all of our Blackboard workshops cover ultra topics. So the grade book, messaging, um, I'm trying to think of what's another example, some engagement stuff using some discussion boards, things like that. So, so we get into more of the specific parts of, of the ultra course view. And then of course we have some more general workshops that just cover pedagogical things, teaching, um, inclusive teaching, universal design, stuff like that. So if you're interested in like being a better teacher or especially a better online teacher, um, take take some of our workshops and work with with our staff because they're really knowledgeable about that kind of stuff and they can help you like rethink your course and maybe or rethink activities for engagement. I know that in the last couple years with all the online stuff, we've seen like some students struggling with with like participation or completing courses. So so it's something that that we're trying to integrate into our workshops is anything that can help you because obviously you're teaching and it's it's stressful when you have students that aren't performing well or just disappearing or whatever or not turning in assignments on time so we're, we're all trying to come up with solutions and as a community to work together so yeah um we're done a little early that's okay I, i'm gonna stick around until three or until everybody leaves um if anyone wants to stick around and talk to me about anything particular i have a little bit of time here so feel free otherwise i'll give you back six minutes, I guess, of your day, and you can get lunch started early. Um, but yeah, hopefully this was helpful. And like I said, feel free to follow up with me at any time. If you need that uh, template, just send me an email at mktaylor, and I can get that template put into your course or your shell. Just make sure you tell me which, which course you want it in. OK, well. Mike, I have a question real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, this is Candy Medina from Foreign Languages. 